Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Matthew Ross, a member of the Wild Ones National Board of Directors and co-chair of the Honorary Directors Committee. Wild Ones is excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, Genetic Diversity and Plant Preservation with Neil DeBull. This webinar is being hosted on YouTube Live. We welcome the use of the chat feature during tonight's presentation. Please sign in to your YouTube account. If you'd like to hide the chat box, please enter full screen mode. Links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below. We have a series of questions that were submitted during registration that were selected to discuss during the question and answer session at the close of tonight's event. We've closed captioning turned on to increase accessibility for all of our attendees. You can turn this feature off in your settings if you choose to do so. As a reminder, this program will be recorded and posted on our website and social media channels. And the link will also be emailed to all registrants in the coming days. If you're experiencing a technical issue during tonight's presentation, please email support at wildones.org. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we're a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We carry out our mission nationally through educational programs such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education grants and webinars like this one. At a local level, Wild Ones chapters also offer many additional programs, including garden tours, speakers, conferences, as well as plant sales, exchanges, and seed collections. Longwood has 66 chapters and 16 seedlings in 24 states across the nation. If you're not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and enjoy the camaraderie and support of being part of a local chapter. If there's not a chapter near you, please think about starting a Wild One seedling chapter in your area. Programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without the generous support from people like you. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today. Wild Ones inspires and empowers people and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant and vital habitats for birds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife. Together, we can continue to educate one another on the importance of native plants and make a positive impact on the environment along the way. Tonight's webinar featuring Neil DeBall discusses genetic diversity and plant preservation, specifically the role plant genetic diversity plays in our gardens, landscapes, and natural areas. Preserving and propagating diverse native plants within ecoregion is important for the survival of native plants and their use in sustainable landscapes of the future. Our presenter, Neil DeBull, was, uh, sorry, has been a Wild Ones member of the Central Wisconsin chapter since 1988, and he became a Wild Ones Lifetime Honorary Director in 2015. Neil DeBull is a pioneer in the native plant industry, recognized internationally as an expert in native plant ecology. He's also a co-owner and longtime prairie ecologist at Prairie Nursery. He has dedicated his life to the propagation of native plants, promoting their benefits, and furthering their use and restoration projects. With that, we're going to have Neil turn on his video. Good evening, Neil, and welcome, and thank you for your many contributions to native plant ecology and to wild ones. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us tonight, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthew. It's great to be with everybody here tonight with this wonderful organization, Wild Ones, started by Laurie Otto so many years ago to help people learn how to improve the environment in their own backyards. And it's one, such a great mission of Wild Ones. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about the fascinating world of plant genetics and reproduction. And I am not a geneticist. I am a nursery person. So uh, what I am going to present tonight is not an expert perspective, but the perspective of someone who has learned over the last 45 years in an inquiry of the amazing variation in the way plants propagate themselves and arrange their genetic material. And it's important in the work I do when we work with native plants 
and we try to be appropriate as far as how we preserve the species. So it's more than just a plant species, but more, more importantly, gene pools. So we're gonna look at a lot of the aspects of genetics and the way plants reproduce. And unfortunately, I know a lot of people are looking for answers tonight, but I fear that I will probably raise more questions than I provide you with answers because as they say, it's complicated. So, uh oh, where do we go here? I seem to be having an issue with my screen share here. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's start here. So, let's look at the basic factors of genetic diversity and how they affect plant preservation. So we have genetic diversity in nature, uh, horticulture versus ecology in the garden. We're going to talk about what is an ecotype and native virus versus straight species and climate change and gardening. So some pretty hot topics here. And we'll look at the genetic aspects of, of individual plants and plants in general to see how we might educate ourselves in the decision-making process in our landscape. So what determines variation in, in diversity? Of course, we all know that plants adapt over time to their growing conditions, such as climate. And of course, climate is changing. It used to be more reliable and we would have a pretty good idea of cold, heat, temperatures, precipitation, wind speeds. And this is a commonly overlooked factor is the wind, because winds can be very desiccating as people in the Western part of the country know. Then you have latitude, which determines day length. Of course, temperatures, north is colder, south is hotter, and just the general seasons. Longitude will determine rainfall because you have the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains influencing the Great Plains where you might have only 12 to 20 inches of rain a year. And as you move into Kansas, you get into 25 inches in Nebraska, then you get into the Midwest and you hit 30 plus inches, and then you get up to 50 to 60 inches in the East Coast. So you have a lot of variation in rainfall as you move from West to East. And then for people that live in montane regions, you have altitude. Of course, you have very many growing zones as you go up a mountain. You can have six, seven, eight different growing zones or uh, habitat zones based upon the climate that is influenced by altitude. So all of these are taken into considerations into consideration as plants adapt to their environments. But most importantly, genetic diversity depends on sex. And if you don't have recombination, of genetic alleles, then you don't have the opportunity to adapt to your environment because you will not have that recombination of different genetic characteristics that allow for the adaptation of plants to changing conditions. So it's extremely important that plants are able to recombine their genes just as animals. So what are the benefits of sexual reproduction? Of course, the recombination of alleles or genetic traits into new mixtures so we can adapt or the plants can adapt. Also, it reduces the chances of homozygous recessive genetic maladies. And for those of you who are familiar with homozygous versus heterozygous, uh, if you have the same negative alleles on, on the egg and the sperm or the male and female portion, they will quote unquote unmask these uh, negative aspects that can lead to a dysfunctional uh, plant. And we see these in humans, with diseases like hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, and sickle cell anemia, you can get the same thing in plants. And lethal plant recessive conditions often are things, things like leaf albinism. So, and practically all animals and many plants are self infertile. So they cannot cross with themselves, requiring them to outcross with another plant to ensure recombination of those alleles. So, sex is very important to the survival of the species. Uh, where I live in central Wisconsin and in many parts of the Midwest, uh, we have a fairly high number of um, Amish uh, settlements in our neighborhood. And it is not uncommon for people to seek husbands and wives outside of their community. So we have people in Wisconsin that get married to people in Indiana or Missouri in another Amish community because the Amish do have an issue with inbreeding and issues as far as different uh, conditions as we talked about earlier. Same thing applies to plants. You want to avoid 
inbreeding depression and problems with different diseases. So let's look at inbreeding depression in local populations. And this is particularly problematic in small populations, small populations of people, small populations of animals like the cheetah. The cheetah is considered a, at a bottleneck in its genetics, it's a very, very difficult situation. And you can see the same thing with plants. And here's a very interesting study about the lakeside daisy, Tetraneurus herbacea, which grows in very isolated populations. And there was one non-reproducing population in Illinois that was cross-pollinated with plants growing near Lake Erie. So they took pollen from plants in Lake Erie to Illinois and cross-pollinated it. And lo and behold, this population in Illinois that had dwindled only 30 individuals and appeared to be self-incompatible with themselves, outcrossed with the Ohio plants, which then allowed them to produce seed. So the injection of new blood led to seed production and rejuvenation of that small population in Illinois. So this is a case where outbreeding is very beneficial when you have a small population where inbreeding has, re has rendered it infertile. Here's a range of lakeside daisy. And as you can see, here's the Illinois population. Here's the Lake Erie population. And just being able to mix those genetics saved that Illinois population. Here's the plant itself. It generally grows in dolomite, rocky dolomite. It doesn't grow on good soil. This is a plant that if you give it good soil, it won't, it won't like you. So it's a, another reason why it's probably quite rare. It has a very specific requirement as far as its habitat. So the big concern of a lot of ecologists is the potential for outbreeding depression. And this is, brings up the whole concept of ecotype and what is an ecotype, and we'll get into a little more detail on that. But what is the actual potential for outbreeding depression in plant populations? So the concern is that if you bring plants or seeds from distant regions, from different ecoregions, and introduce them into another ecoregion, are they, gonna, are they going to interbreed with the local population and create maladaptive progeny? And studies have shown that the F2 and F3, second and third generations, plant generations from crosses between dis distant populations did indeed exhibit less fitness than local plants. So what's gonna happen here? Will the genetically maladaptive offspring die and not reproduce, thus protecting the local population from genetic pollution? Or will they pollute the population and weaken it to the point where it could be diminished? And this is particularly problematic in small populations of a given species, which could be susceptible to genetic swamping by introducing large quantities of distant plants that are not adapted to that region, breeding with the local plants, and rendering the progeny and the majority of future plants not adapted to the area. This, this needs a lot, of, a lot more study. There have been some studies as noted previously, but what is, what is the limitation of the adaptability of plants. And this comes to the concept of plasticity of a gene pool. How much adaptive capacity is there within a given species, a given ecotype, a given region of those plants? And we'll get into a little more detail on that later. So we looked a little bit briefly at sexual reproduction. Let's look at asexual plant reproduction. And this is where things get very interesting. Uh, natural cloning. And most plants do reproduce sexually, but a lot of plants and more plants, surprisingly, a number, high number of plants will reproduce asexually. So you have a concept called cleistogamy, where you have non-opening self-fertilizing flowers, particularly common in violets and legumes. And then even more interesting is apomixis, where the flowers are not actually fertilized. They bypass meiosis, the recombination of, of um, sexual material through pollination, the seeds that result from these self-pollinated, essentially, flowers are genetically identical to the parent. And this is quite common in the rose family, aster family, and grass family. So more common than we might think. Here you can see some cleistogamous flowers at the base of this violet plant. You can see some other flowers over the edge, but these will be asexual reproduction seeds that are produced, even though they're not fertilized. Let's look at some, uh, some very interesting conditions. Sergeant crab apple, Malus sargentii, a switch hitter, as you might want to say. A member of the rose family, very complicated genetics. So a friend of mine, Michael Yanni of JN Plant Selections in Milwaukee, 
He grew seeds of Sergeant Crab in three successive years. In 1980, all the plants he grew from the seeds he collected off one tree were essentially identical, indicating that they were likely of apomictic origin, meaning that they were a sexual reproduction and not from sexual recombination. He collected seeds the next year, and the plants that he grew from the same tree were all different from each other, almost certainly due to cross-pollination and recombination. So he took a third year of seed in 1982, and he grew them, and they were identical again, just like in 1980. So what in the world is going on? The tree is selecting whether to, to produce plants apomictically or sexually from year to year. And Mike, who does all kinds of amazing breeding, grafting, growing from seed, he has no idea what's going on. So who knows? So what are the pluses and minus of asexual reproduction? You have some advantages. It's more efficient. You don't have to invest all that plant material and energy into uh, pollen and nectar. You're less subjected, less subject to weather conditions for successful pollination. And if you have a bad year when you have cold, wet weather, when a lot of pollinators are flying and you don't get pollinated, you're not going to make seeds or you'll make significantly reduced numbers of seeds. And only proven clones are produced, reducing seedling mortality because you have a winning plant that has been doing well and it's successful. You're producing clones of that plant, not unlike the nursery trade. Okay. Disadvantages, of course, the lack of sexual recombination reduces the ability to adapt to changes in the environment. And that's going to become increasingly important as we see the acceleration of climate change. Here's one of my favorite topics. Uh, this is how I really got into genetics was back in college, which was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, I had a project for my uh, plant physiology class and I investigated polyploidy, playing with an extra deck. So normal plants are diploid with two sets of chromosomes, just like people and most animals. Polyploid plants have extra chromosomes. They can have four, six, or eight. It's rare that they have more, but four, six, and eight is significantly more than two. So you can have varying levels of ploidy that can occur even within the same species. So theoretically, they're not actually species because one of the definitions of species is being able to interbreed and plants with different numbers of chromosomes are unable to mix their genes together successfully and cannot interbreed. So there's some issues with that as far as whether or not they're species. Polyploid strains, interestingly, typically grow in very stressful habitats. Saltwater estuaries have a very high percentage of polyploid plants. And as you go farther north into extreme cold northern latitudes, you see an increase in polyploid plants. So what are the advantages of polyploid? Why would a plant do this? Well, you have a wider set of genes from which to choose in your toolbox to adapt to a difficult conditions. But you have disadvantages. It takes a lot more energy to produce all these extra chromosomes and carry all that extra baggage. But um, a lot of plants are polyploid, especially ferns, grasses. Uh, there's some tetraploid apples, kiwi fruit, potatoes, leeks, peanuts, cotton, rice. A lot of, a lot of your grains are polyploid. Let's look at some examples. Ferns, 99% of ferns are believed to be polyploid. Grass is about 80% are estimated to be polyploid. And interestingly, you have different wheats with different polyploides. Durham wheat for pasta is tetraploid with 28 chromosomes, seven for each. And then bread wheat is hexaploid with six sets, 42 times seven. No, excuse me, six times seven. So you have these same quote unquote species, but they have different numbers of chromosomes and thus re rendering them infertile between each other. Here's a really interesting example, black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa. This plant typically does not require sexual reproduction or does not participate in sexual reproduction. Let's look at the examples here. Here's, a, here's the range of Aronia melanocarpa, common in the Northeast, down in the Appalachians and up into the Northern upper Midwest. What is so interesting about this is it has diploid and a tetraploid strain. The diploid strain occurs in New England and reproduces sexually with recombination of alloys, of alleles. The polyploid tetraploid strain with double the chromosome occurs throughout the majority of its range and reproduces almost exclusively by apomixis, where the flowers do not cross with other plants. The seeds develop from unfertilized embryos that are essentially clones of that plant. So here's a species widely planted and widely, fairly widely distribu distributed 
that is not participating participating in sexual reproduction and is creating clones of its plants pretty much throughout its range. So what is the ecotype of black chokeberry throughout its range? Is it identical throughout? Uh, this could use some more study, but it is believed that it's essentially a clonal plant throughout its entire range. Switchgrass, here's another interesting one. A common prairie grass comes in hexaploid six and octoploid eight chromosome sets. Uh, this is particularly common farther in the Midwest and farther West. Hexaploid switchgrass typically grows in sloughs and wet prairies where moisture is abundant, sometimes flooded. Octoploid switchgrass grows in an exact opposite situation on dry sandy soils and dunes where moisture is limited. So here you have what is supposedly the same species and they can actually grow fairly close to each other and have been documented to grow fairly close to each other particularly out in Nebraska, but yet they are two completely different entities in terms of their genetics and cannot even interbreed with each other. So now what's your what's what's the ecotype? The hexaploid or the octoploid? What's the what's the plasticity in these things? And remember these have a lot of extra genetic baggage and, and toolbox. Can they be more adaptable in wider range of areas? Unknown, but theoretically they should. So let's go to ecotypes. How important are ecotypes? We could talk about this all night long. Okay? The most important thing here about ecotypes is we really are woefully ignorant of what is actually factual. And we know some general rules of thumb, and this has been shown over decades, that functionally, you can move plants two or three degrees latitude north or south, and they will still function as they would in their normal original location. It's, and they're more primarily responding to seasonality, length of season, light, etc. But plants that are moved too far north will not be cold hardy, at least in the old days, maybe that, that's changing now. But in the past, of course, plants that were moved north wouldn't grow. And I've killed a lot of southern species trying to grow them at my place. And plants that are moved too far south bloom early, they get leggy, and for some reason, they're more susceptible to fungal diseases. And that may just be the fact that you have higher rainfall, higher humidities in Southern climates than you do in Northern climates in general, okay? And plants that are moved from arid Western regions to moister Eastern climates are often also subject to fungal attack, again, because they don't have to have defenses against fungus in their drier, more xeric communities farther West. And of course, there've been some very interesting studies of plants that are moved up and down mountains where they take the same species and move them up or down and the adaptive, the adaptive range for many species is not so great. And it's very uh, common to see them fail by moving them too far up or down a mountain, even within the same species. And here's something that is commonly not considered, the zephyr. What is the west winds effect on North American plants? We have prevailing westerly winds in North America. So they blow pollen and perhaps more importantly, mature seeds from west to east. Now pollen is quickly dissipated. So the influence of pollen moving on the wind is not gonna be that great at distant locales. And the chances of pollen encountering the appropriate species at the right time is going to be pretty tricky, especially when it's coming that far. But seeds are a completely different game. Seeds can move long distance with actual real genetic uh, material and influence potentially the, the makeup of plants to the east. An example I give here, a milkweed seed from Kansas can be in Ohio in one day on a steady 25 mile an hour wind. So how do you control that? If you're looking at ecotypes, you have this incessant west wind blowing into the east. How much influence is that? I don't think anybody has actually studied this. I don't know how you would study this. It would be a very complex thing to undertake, but it's certainly an influence, at least at some level. Migrating birds. This is particularly interesting. They move plants mostly north to south in the fall. You don't see a lot of movement of seeds from south to north because that's occurring in the spring when most seeds in the south are not ripe. But what about the influence of birds moving seeds from north to south in September, October, November as they migrate? Here's a really interesting study. Well, not study, just you know, back. The Chiapas pine, which was once considered a subspecies of eastern white pine, Pinus chiapensis, 
is distributed in the highlands of southern Mexico and into western Guatemala. Uh, Chiapas, Oaxaca, Veracruz. Uh, very interestingly, this pine tree looks really a lot like our native white pine. If you showed me that picture and said, Neil, is that a white pine? I say, absolutely. You bet that's a white pine. Well, it's a Chiapas white pine. Now, how did the white pine, which occurs in Central North America, Northern North America, New England, how did that end up in the mountains of Mexico? I'm assuming that it did not originate there, that it almost certainly came from the United States and was most likely brought there by birds. Now, we don't have a lot of other evidence of this occurring with other species that we know of, but here's a really interesting case study where you have a very similar species that almost certainly was brought very far south by birds into a montane zone that had sufficiently similar growing conditions as it did in its home lands, home area in Northeast United States. I used to work for the Forest Service in Colorado, in Western Colorado, and my work there was usually over in mid-October, and so I would go home to Wisconsin, and the aspens in Wisconsin were turning at exactly the same time that the aspens in Colorado, between eight and 9,000 feet, were turning. There were some of the very same species that grew between eight and 9,000 feet in Colorado as grew in Wisconsin, or similar species within the same genus. So you have, again, the influence of altitude and latitude affecting what plants are adapted where and the similarities in those growing conditions could allow for the growth of the same or very similar species. Another thing that is very unusual, we saw this with the switchgrass, the hexaploid that grows in wet ditches and the octoploid that grows on dry sand dunes. In central Wisconsin, little blue stem typically grows on dry sandy uplands, including sand dunes. I mean, if you want to stabilize a sand dune, Little blue stem will grow in it. But I have seen rare populations of little blue stem that grow in wet prairies. And these are documented by other investigators. Even alongside prairie cardgrass, Pachina pecanata, where water, standing water can be commonplace. So, what in the world is little blue stem, which we always think of as being in dry upland grass, what in the world is it doing growing in this wet prairie? And it's only a few feet from upland populations of little blue stem that are growing on the dry sand. So, I have not done any investigation of the genetics of this, but the question then becomes, is there more ecotypic and genetic variation between two neighboring strains that grow in completely different situations than there is between the actual species that could be far, far distant from one another? So what is the variation between the same species or apparently the same species growing in these disparate environments? Big questions looming, hard to say. Here's the beautiful little blue stem, Spitzitarium scoparium. Great landscape plant, as we all know. So this then comes to the question of what is the genetic plasticity of plant genomes? What is the adaptability of a local ecotype or a given species? And this is where we just don't know. And to obtain this kind of information would require an immense amount of research. I know some people are working on this, but you'd have to really do a lot of a lot of investigation of the genetics and how do you compare the genetics and the adaptability. And I tell you, I used to be a plant fundamentalist and I didn't plant anything more than maybe I'd go 200 miles and grudgingly plant something from 200 miles until my parents wanted some prairie plants for their backyard in St. Louis, where I grew up. So I said, well, I don't know if these are going to work, but I'll send them to you. And they're about five or six degrees latitude south from central Wisconsin. And I sent them, sent them these plants, and the vast majority of them performed quite nicely. Now, performing and creating a sustainable ecosystem or a sustainable community is a completely different thing. But the fact that they did well for decades pretty much astounded me. So I did not expect that. So I think that plants might be a little more flexible and have a little more plasticity in their genome than we might give them credit for. But again, it does depend upon what parameters we are using as far as measuring what is the adaptability or the utility or the performance of that plant within a given landscape. So between climate, rainfall, soil type, day length, all these factors come into play. 
But as many of us often ask, how in the world is that buckthorn, honeysuckle, and garlic mustard? How do they just spread like wildfire? Now, of course, they have no enemies, but yet they're able to move in to large areas across large regions, uh, seemingly unopposed. Very interestingly, here in central Wisconsin, where we have a lot of sand, where I live is on a dolomite ridge with sand, a sandy soil below it. And somebody planted a red pine plantation on the property in 1950, 72 years ago. When I moved there in 1988, there was buckthorn infesting the dolomitic slopes. And of course, buckthorn likes alkaline soils and it ruled the dolomite slopes. And I, of course, have cleared all that, great, a great pain and agony, but it's gone and I keep after it. Underneath the red pines, which were planted in dry sand at the bottom of the hill, there was no buckthorn, none whatsoever for years. And suddenly, buckthorn started to invade underneath the red pines. So why was this? How could it have been that there was buckthorn on the dolomitic slopes? Mature plants, I mean, four or five, six inch diameter buckthorn when I got there, producing seeds. Why were they on the dolomitic slopes? and nowhere on that dry sand. And then 20 years after I had moved there, suddenly they started appearing on the dry sand. Was this the evolution and adaptation in front of my very eyes? That's my conclusion, that this buckthorn, which really didn't have the ability to grow in a dry sandy soil, suddenly some species or some, some individuals found their way down there and then were able to reproduce and colonize it, much to my chagrin. So here's, I think, perhaps the, the most important question as wild ones that we have to ask ourselves and we have to ask other gardeners. Horticulture versus ecology in our gardens. Horticulture versus ecology. I'm an ecologist. I've never taken a course in horticulture. I know, I know enough about horticulture to be dangerous. I, I, I am a let's plant them all, let God sort them out kind of guy and not select plants because I don't think that we can truly select superior individuals, unless you're looking for seed size, yield, taste, flower, et cetera. Okay, yes, we can do that. But from an ecological standpoint and from a functional ecosystem standpoint, are we going to be able to improve on that? Well, there are some things that we can do. And we'll get into that a little bit later when we get into the wonderful topic of native ours. But historically, for the last 10,000 years, people have selected plants and animals to meet their needs. And our gardens have been more for us than for other organisms. What is so cool is that in the last 50 years, and credit a lot of this to Laureato, planting gardens, not just for us, planting gardens for all life. And that's, I think, summarizes what Wild Ones is all about. Horticulture has typically focused on what's in it for me. And not to, not to denigrate horticulture, but that's pretty much what the story has been. And there's good reasons for that. If we didn't have horticulture, we wouldn't have high yielding grains. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't enjoy the lifestyle that we have today. But from a garden standpoint, where we were interested in ecological restoration, ecology seeks to maximize the genetic diversity within a given species without regard to specific characteristics that we may want to see. So, and in theory, and I, this is a generally accepted theory, that preservation of broad gene pools in regions provides maximum plasticity for ability to adapt to changing climate and world. So that is, the, in the nutshell, what we try and do here at Prairie Nursery is we do ecology. And in the 90s, I had the most awesome trial garden of native ours. I was totally into this. I had echinaceas and liatris and all these different hybrids, I mean, naturally occurring hybrids, amazing plants. And people from Holland came and said, send those to us, we'll make you millions. And I was mesmerized by this. And I almost went down that evil path to horticulture. <laughs> but I put on the brakes and said, wait a minute, this is not what we do here. We're about ecological and genetic diversity. And it was absolutely a difficult decision because all these really cool plants with beautiful flowers in different forms. And I basically gave it all up because what we do here is try to, to have as broad a gene, gene pool as possible. So. And the question is, can we improve on nature? Can we improve on nature? And I'm not saying we can't, but it depends upon the parameters that you're using to measure improvement. What are you using to say this is better than what nature has? So here, we're of the, may the best plants win 
So we almost all of our plants are sown by seed, open pollinated seeds. We do some cuttings. For instance, uh, to collect seeds of phlox, which are exploding seeds, it is impossible to get in enough quantity of seeds to grow your plants. So we assembled a wide variety of different uh, genomes of different of each flock species, and then we take cuttings from those. So we do vegetative reproduction of a few species that are difficult to produce from seed. There are a few that we do from root divisions like shooting star, dodecatha, and media. In that case, uh, it takes forever to grow plants from seed to, to a full size, five to six years. So we grew seeds from a variety of different populations of shooting star and then established those in the field. And then we take root cuttings from those. But the vast majority of our plants are grown from open pollinated seeds. So, and we load up those plugs. So we have a number of different individual seedlings in each plug. And you may get, when you buy a plant from us, you may get two or three or four different plants within the same pot. And that's by intention. So let's just look at some of the flats. Here's purple fairy clover, Dahlia purpurea. Usually you're gonna have three to five seedlings per plug. These are then potted up into three inch pots, which we sell to our customers. And the echinaceas, this is Echinacea paradoxa, Ozark coneflower, which interesting, interestingly is from Southern Missouri and Northern Arkansas, and it does just fine in central Wisconsin. At least it grows fine and it makes seeds. And I don't know if it's gonna create sustaining populations, but surprisingly it grows way farther north than we would have expected. Porcupine sedge, Carex cistracina. Again, you can see there's four, five, six, three to six different seedlings in each plug, and they're going to fight it out. And prairie smoke, GM triforum. I have no, no idea how many <laughs> individual species, individual plants there are in each one of those plugs, but there's a lot. So this way, in short, that not only do we have vigorous plants, but we also usually will provide you with more than one plant in that pot. Now onto the fun part. Native ours, blessing or curse. So we all know why we select native ours. Big flowers, cool foliage, compact form, whatever it is. But there is a price to be paid when you start selecting for specific characteristics. And I know that uh, in the drought, some of the drought years we've had, a lot of people who had planted some of these fascinating echinacea varieties and hybrids had serious losses because apparently they lost their drought hardiness through this breeding and selection process. So sometimes you're narrowing the genetics of beneficial uh, characteristics by selecting for those really cool different flowers. Some of those weird echinaceas I'm not particularly fond of, but there's some amazing ones. I don't grow them myself, but I can see how people would be seduced by them. So, and we are worried about nectar and pollen quality and people are finding that indeed this is a valid concern. And of course, many of your hybrids are sterile. So they provide little or no nectar and thus they provide no pollinator services whatsoever or limited pollinator services, services for butterflies, bees, et cetera. Now, can we breed plants for ecological function and service? I think there are in fact, people are starting to do this now. So this is an interesting new area to breed plants for increased pollen and nectar quality and extended bloom time. If the plant blooms for a longer period of time, will you be able to provide services to more pollinators? These would probably be more generalist pollinators rather than uh, obligate pollinators that require uh, a certain species or genus. But hey, anything can help if you can extend that period of bloom. So let's see what, what, what little we know. And I, I don't claim to be up to speed on this. There's probably perhaps new research is coming out. But uh, anyway, who was a graduate student at the University of Vermont, studied about a dozen different species, uh, the strange species and the native virus. And she found that seven strange species, species of natives were visited by more pollinators than their cultivar equivalents. Four species were visited equally. And one cultivar was actually frequently, was more frequently visited by pollinators than the varietal straight species. So more than 50% of native ours did not do as well as the straight species. And then Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware has been studying caterpillar preferences. And he's found that they do not seem to prefer leaves of cultivars or straight species over one another, with the exception of red or purple leaves that were less utilized. And he found no difference also in the utilization of green versus selected variegated leaves. But purple and red were much less utilized by caterpillars for whatever reason. So the preliminary data indicates 
that, yeah, native virus are not doing the job of the strange species, at least of the ones that were studied here. So let me show you some examples of some, I don't know if I'm gonna call them native virus, I'm gonna call them plant selections. A friend of mine, some 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, saved a butterfly weed plant that was growing in a wet mesic prairie in Racine County in southeastern Wisconsin. She went out in front of the bulldozers that were plowing up the whole doggone prairie, and she dug out about a three foot root of this butterfly weed in the summer. And the fact that the plant even survived was a miracle. She took it home to her home in a small lot in Milwaukee. She nursed it back to health for three years, and it finally bloomed, and she was able to grow plants from it. And she provided me with some seeds, which I have used to grow butterfly weed for clay for the last 30 years. And this, normally, this plant grows only on well-drained sandy soil, sandy loam soils, at least in our region. I think there are some, some populations out east that will grow on heavier soils, but in Wisconsin, Minnesota, this is pretty much restricted to sandy soils. This plant grew on wet mesic clay. So it was a pretty amazing plant. And we, our customers have had very good results with this. So it's great to have some sort of a variety that can be grown on the soils that are predominant in many people's yards. More people have heavier soils than they have with sand. So we're able to provide people with a butterfly weed plant, which is of course has great pollinator services on a, in a situation where ordinarily the regular butterfly weed would never grow. So here's a case where a specific plant, an individual, it's not even a gene pool, it's an individual plant that has the ability to provide pollinator services in a wider variety of soils or a different variety of type of soil. So, so I think I'm uh, preaching to the choir here about native plants being uh, plants of the future because we know that they're adapted to local conditions, whatever local conditions are going to be in the future. But look at the prairie plants. They're adapted to, to heat and drought and cold. It's truly amazing. Uh, we have a lot of customers north of us are in zone three and they've used plants that are supposed to be zone four plants and they have survived three or four, well, three polar vortexes in the last decade in zone three. So sometimes just because a plant is not distributed in a certain location does not mean that it is not hardy there. And we'll see some more examples of that. And of course, lower maintenance and lower cost than many non-natives. And perhaps most importantly, that natives are utilized by pollinators, thousands of pollinators, as opposed to non-natives, which often have very limited pollinator services. So, and there are native invas invasive native plants. So, I mean, talk about invader, Canada goldenrod, the bane of my existence. I will take Canada thistle over Canada goldenrod any day. So here's a native plant that's completely out of control, but it's the exception rather than the rule. And if you look at some of the terrible non-native plants that we've introduced, leafy spurge, cheatgrass, and you, the list goes on, and we can talk about buckthorn and honeysuckle and mugwort and all these nasties. So why do we want to preserve open pollinated native plants? To preserve diverse gene pools for future adaptability, retain the traits of heat and drought tolerance in a warming climate, ensuring that plants can provide ecological services to pollinators, and if you're into native virus, you've got to have the baseline genetic gene pool if you're going to breed new selections. So you've got to have that wide variety of open pollinated plants from which to select the new quote unquote superior plants. And now you can make the decision on the superiority of those plants. But if you're looking at perhaps enhancing pollinator services, if you can start with some wide diversity of the natives, you might have a much better chance at achieving your goals. So I'm focused on prairies, but my original love was, was trees. And I would go out and collect seed of the maple trees, black maple in Southern Missouri and the Ozarks and grow those in my backyard and um, white oaks. But let's look at the difference between the herbaceous native plant industry and the woody plant business. Since most of us in the herbaceous plant business grow our plants from seeds, open pollinated seeds, we are able to provide at least some semblance of genetic diversity. However, most of the woody plants grown in the United States are cultivars, including most natives, not all, but most, and a lot of the shrubs. So we are essentially planting near genetic monocultures across extensive swaths of our urban and suburban landscapes. Think about it, when you go to buy a woody plant, unless you go to a specific nursery that sells open pollinated trees, the vast majority of consumers, even if they're buying a native tree, 
they're buying a selection. So there might be two, three, four, or five selections of a certain species. Wow, how much genetic diversity is that? Why? Why do we do this? Well, how many of you have grown trees from seeds? You will know that there's a huge variation in tree vigor, the form, the fall color, disease resistance. It's all over the place. Okay, that's the beauty of variation, but it's not the beauty for the tree nursery owner because I will tell you the variation is can be very disappointing. And I have trees of American chestnut, of uh, uh, basswood, uh, and others, and uh, sugar maple and black maple that I have planted, grown from seeds, side by side, 20 plus years ago. And some of them are 20, 30 feet tall now, and others are only a foot or two or five taller than the day I planted them, and they are planted within a few feet of each other, a few hundred feet of each other. This shows you the amazing variety, the phenotypic variety within the genetics of seeds. So if you are a nursery person and you're selling these dud trees, whoa, you're in big trouble. So people are going to come back, they're going to want replacements, you're going to get a bad reputation. So that's why in, this, in the woody industry, a lot of people make sure they sell only tried and true selections, native or, or non-native. They want to have the cultivars that they know are going to work. And so they don't have angry customers coming back and confusing them or selling them junk. So I don't have an answer to this. This is a business decision for a lot of owners, a lot of business owners. What are they going to do? Are they going to take the chance on poor quality trees, quote unquote? Or are they going to prefer to err on customer satisfaction? This is a big issue, folks. This is a really big issue. How about some assisted migration? Let's talk about that. So should native plants be moved north into habitats that they have not occupied in recent history? Well, plants move around. This is the thing that always fascinates me. People, people are saying, well, we can't move plants because they don't belong here. Well, what the heck belongs here? If I were to restore the native vegetation of central Wisconsin 15,000 years ago, what would I have to plant? I would have to plant approximately one mile of ice, if you believe the gospel according to the geologists. A mile of ice, 15,000 years ago, that's an eye blink in geologic history. And after the glaciers retreated, the vegetation, the original invading vegetation on the fresh soil were spruce and fir. We know this from bog pollen record analyses spruce and fir, and then pines, and then climate got warmer and drier, and oaks moved in, and then maples and, and sugar, and basswood came in as it got moisture, and then it got really dry, the zero thermic period, and prairies and oaks moved in, and then we have this patchwork of all kinds of different communities that were here upon the, at the time of European contact. So what is the appropriate vegetation for any given place? Are we saying that the vegetation that was documented in 1840 before, right at the time of, of European contact with, with, the, with new, new land, with the local people, is that what is the appropriate vegetation and we have to stick to that? Is that the gospel? Well, climate's change, plant communities change. At this point, it's like, what the heck is gonna grow in this new climate? So I'm a little more liberal than a lot of people who would say, well, we have to restore what the, what the vegetation was here 170 years ago because that's what belongs here. Well, it's not what belongs here, it's what was growing here. And there are many reasons why it was growing here. Why do we have hemlock trees and beech trees that only grow 10 to 20 miles in from Lake Michigan? People say it's because of the, of the cool, moist conditions along Lake Michigan. Well, if you go 10 miles west of there, you'll find bur oaks and white oaks and swamp white oaks. I say it's because people were burning the landscape. And when they got, usually if you were along the Fox River in Northeastern Wisconsin, if you had about a 10 mile an hour wind, it would burn. If you started the fire in the morning, it would burn to the county line, Brown County, Tulani County line, which is where I used to live. And that's where the sugar maples, basswoods, and beaches occurred. So it, that fire would burn until evening. And then the temperature would drop, the relative humidity would go up, and the fire would go out. So it's probably more human influence as far as what the vegetation was than climatic influence. So there's many, many different possibilities for what can grow where. And you'll see inclusions of sugar maple basswood forest right in the middle of prairies and oak savannas. Why is that? Because they were protected from fire. In the state of Michigan, you'll see sugar maple basswood forests on the east side of lakes. The prairie fires were driven by westerly winds and you have oaks to the west, north and south. And, but on the east side of the lake, you'll have these little, little refugia of a mesic forest. So this was not due to climate, this was due to human activity. At any rate, 
So people have moved plants across the landscape. Uh, and there's uh, Native American camps where you'll find dye plants and food plants completely disjunct from their main populations. So, hey, there's nothing wrong with moving plants, in my opinion. You can make your own conclusion, but this is not something new. It's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So, what is our responsibility in climate change? What is our responsibility? It's so hard to know what the future plant communities will be. They're not going to be what they used to be. So our attempts to recreate the previous ones, although laudable and in many cases perfectly possible, there will be some situations where that will become impossible because of climate change. So we have to almost craft new communities and they're going to be hybrid communities of existing species, southern species, etc. I myself have been moving plants from south to north for many years because I'm a curious plant dude. But what are some of the issues associated with this process? Season length, okay, if we're moving plants from south to north, season fruits of southern genotypes may survive, but they have an insufficient season to mature. I've had pawpaw trees growing in my yard for 20 years. I never get a mature fruit. They'll make fruit, but they'll never make it to maturity. We get a frost before they can mature. Photo period, plants to the south, have different photo period from plants to the north. We have longer days in the summer, shorter days in the fall and the spring after uh, the equinox. So it's very interesting to see how plants respond to that. And when you're moving plants large distances, what will be the impact of photo period on their performance? Lots of unknowns here. And then pollinators. Obligate pollinators, what are the influences here? If you move a plant from south to north, will they even have the pollinators that they rely upon? Will the pollinators move with them? Well, probably will, because I'll have to show you that later. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. I wonder what happened to that. There we go. Well, let's talk about this. Loss of historical migration corridors. Um, this is another huge issue because plant genomes across each species range prior to the destruction of 90 plus percent of our ecological integrity we're probably in a continuum of genes and alleles rather than discrete individual regional ecotypes because they had contact all the way across where there was expanse of prairie, woodland, et cetera. So with fragmentation, you would expect gene pools would narrow because they have these small plant community remnants in many cases. And they would also be constricted because the movement of terrestrial fauna that transport their seeds would also be blocked by farm fields, cities, et cetera. So now you're getting these increasingly isolated populations that no longer have contact with a larger gene pool and you run the risk of inbreeding depression as we talked about earlier. And now the opportunity for animal and plant and animal migration through all this development is significantly limited. What are the implications for our plant populations? How do we maintain genetically diverse populations when they're so fragmented and broken up? And if you look at the future, what species are going to be favored and which ones will be disfavored? Plant species that produce seeds that travel by air or are delivered by birds should have an advantage over other species that have heavy seeds or that don't fly or are not utilized and are transported by birds. So who will be the winners and the losers in the new Anthropocene world? If you can travel by air or bird, you're probably going to have a much better chance of being a winner than those that do not. So here's the case study here that I wanted to mention. Dutchman's pipe, Isotrema macrophylla. Don't you love that? They just changed the name. So this is the name of the week. So, <laughs> you know, when the common name becomes more reliable than the scientific name, you know you've got a problem with the religion. So anyway, moving right along. So Dutchman's pipe, formerly Aristolochia macrophylla, is this really interesting vine, and it is utilized by the pipe vine swallowtail. Here's the distribution of the plant. As you can see, it's pretty much an Appalachian plant. The blue in, are areas where the plant has been introduced and is not originally native. The green, and these are from, um, from the um, website that put together the biota of North American flora. Amazing, amazing resource. Bonap.com, B-O-N-A-P. If you want to find out where any plant is native to, just go to B-O-N-A-P.com. Amazing resource. So here you have this range, pretty restricted. And I have a customer who lives just south of Green Bay. 
and he planted pipevine. And he was thinking, maybe I'll get a pipevine swallowtail, thinking this is an absurd, crazy idea. Within two years, he had pipevine swallowtail. Out in the world did the pipevine swallowtail come all that distance. Now, Isotrema macrophylla is not the only species of pipe vine that this butterfly utilizes, but they're all much farther south down in Texas, Louisiana. And so here's the pipe vine swallowtail range, generally range. So it does actually extend well north of where the actual plants occur, at least these species. But still, it had to go a long ways to get up here. And there have been a number of cases in Wisconsin to that, excuse me, a number of cases in Wisconsin where this plant, where this butterfly has been noted, but they're generally vagrants that are blown off course, or possibly somebody also planted pipevine swallowtail and they found it. But how in the world did this butterfly go from populations in West Virginia, North Carolina, Virginia, all the way up into Northeastern Wisconsin? So, hey, they say plant it, they will come. This is an extreme example of that. So, Here's a blunt force plant <laughs> breeding story. Um, I was lucky enough to get some royal catchfly seed, Silene regia, from a prairie in West Central Ohio near Dayton in zone six. We're in zone four. I germinated and grew the seeds, got plants, put them out. The first winter, 80% died. Not very hardy. I took the seed from the survivors, only 60% died. Plant the seeds from that, 40%. Plant the seeds from that. I was, after about five or six generations, I had a 95%, almost 100% strain. It was hardy to zone four. A friend of mine who lives up in Sault Ste. Marie on Lake Superior says, Neil, I love that plant. Can you send me some? I said, Dan, I don't think these are going to grow in Sault Ste. Marie. He said, oh, come on, just send me some. I sent him some. Not only did they survive, but they self-sowed into his lawn in Sault Ste. Marie, zone three. So sometimes... It's surprising how much genetic plasticity there might be within a plant. Here's a beautiful royal catchfly, Silene regia, fantastic for hummingbirds. And of course, he wanted it for the hummingbirds as well as a beautiful flower. Here's a close up of the flower. Who wouldn't want to grow this plant? And here's the range. So, my plants, my seed came from here. I live here. Dan lives here. <laughs> it's a long ways. But, hey, a lot of woody plants are winter hardy well north of the native range. And I'm sure many of you know this who have, have been doing it. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I've been planting smoke tree, red bud, fringe tree, not tulip tree, kind of a weedy plant, and bottle brush buckeye. All four of those five that I planted have survived for me in zone four. Look at their look at smoke tree. Beautiful plant. My smoke tree is not this big yet, but it's only been in there 20 years. I don't know how old this is. Probably grows slower, 25 years. No. Here's the flowers. Here's the range. Look at that range. I live here. Why is it growing there? That's breaking the rules. It shouldn't be there. American red bud. We have a strain called the Columbus strain from Columbus, Wisconsin, okay? Which was not native there, but somebody found it and found it was hard. It was found growing in Columbus, Wisconsin. Probably somebody planted it and it survived. American fringe tree, Cheananthus, or Chinanthus, depending on how you say it. Mine are not growing that fast. Look at the native range. I'm growing it here. I've, I've, it's been in there for about 15 years. I lost my first one of four this past winter. I don't know why. It's been through polar vortexes, but last year was not a particularly bad winter, and I lost my kind of this. Tulip tree, kind of a weed in its range. Most people would consider it that. It's a, it's a climax weed tree. Okay. Now, interestingly, this has been planted up in, uh, in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, and only recently, and probably due to warmer, warmer winters, seedlings are now starting to survive. So the trees would produce seedlings, but they would be winter killed. So, and bottle brush buckeye. This grows for me, no problem. Not fast, but it grows. And look at this native range, Alabama, South Carolina. What in the heck is that thing doing up in Wisconsin? But what about the children? So I can grow these plants. I can transplant them. They survive the winters, but how many of them are going to actually be able to reproduce? Tulip tree is the exception here. So is there a right or wrong in the garden? 
Should genetic diversity take precedence over improved selection? Will more consumers with more education and understanding the importance of pollinators and general ecological integrity of our gardens, will consumers start to demand open pollinated plants over cultivars? I can tell you many of our customers do. They specifically come to us because they don't want cultivars. They want the real deal. They want the open pollinated native species that are going to bring in the pollinators, et cetera. And the real question is, will gardeners begin to view their landscapes as ecological communities rather than just gardens for their own pleasure? This is where we have to go. We have to view our gardens as ecological communities. They're not just a collection of plants. These are communities of plants that, are, that extend far beyond just the beautiful flowers, the foliage, et cetera. They create habitat for insects, for birds, for a wide variety of different critters. They provide habitat for mice and for voles and for all sorts of rabbits. Okay? And people say, I ask people, do you like owls? Yeah, I love owls. Do you like hawks? I love hawks. Well, what do they eat? <laughs> they eat mice and voles and snakes and rabbits. So if you want hawks and owls, you got to have the other guys that you may not think are so think of so kindly. And this is the this is the revolution that's necessary in the mind of the gardener is what is good and what is bad. And if I don't have holes in the leaves of my plants, my garden is a failure, a total failure because I'm not feeding anybody. I don't have caterpillars eating them. If I don't have plants that are being consumed and they're perfect and pristine. I am a total gardening failure. So what is the role of the nursery trade in genetic preservation? And will native ours be selective for improved ecological services? So these are big questions, but it's really gonna be driven by the customer because I will tell you, if the, if, uh, <laughs> if the customers don't buy it, the nurseries won't grow it. And when I started out doing this 40 years ago this year, 40th year, I had a botanic garden of native prairie plants that nobody wanted to buy. And over time, finally, people started to discover them. But the ones that didn't have flowers or big flowers or showy flowers or this fall color, those went by the wayside. And so there are species that we still don't grow that I used to grow 35, 40 years ago, simply because there was no demand for it. That's changing. We're starting to see more interest in, in, in diversity in the garden. And so there are plants that I tried to grow, I tried to sell 35 years ago that now are selling, but not all of them, because they're just not showy. So, but human nature always plays a role in nature. So, hey, we're curious. What's the next new thing? What's the biggest, the best? Hey, Americans, they want the biggest and the best, right? That's what we do. We're not going to change that. We're not going to change that. But how do we harness these forces? We get people to think differently. Hey, my landscape's got more pollinators than you do, as opposed to my lawn's better than yours. Okay, get rid of your weeds. Well, my weeds support pollinators and bees, but you can't do that. You got to spray them. Well, what if it was more important to have pollinators than a, a pristine lawn? And, or rare species. Or, hey, I got less lawn than you do. It's just a matter of perception. Strictly a matter of perception because we are a herd species. Sorry, that's the reality of it. Some of us are crazy people that, that, that go to a different drummer, but most people follow the rules and they follow the herd. So we have to change the way we think. We've got to get the different drummer going. And the only way we're going to do that is to go native. You know, thank you for an excellent presentation. We appreciate you being here and sharing your time and expertise with all of us. And before we start the question and answer with Neil DeBall, Please check the description underneath today's presentation. And we ask that you will fill out this survey that you can see here at the end of tonight's presentation. Your honest feedback greatly helps us improve our webinar experience for future events. The survey link will also be mailed, emailed to attendees following the event. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, do not miss the talk about weed ordinances, the Roseanne plant, on March 23rd, and Eric Fusilier's three-part series on native plants for stormwater, air quality, and soil contamination in April. Now, before we get back into our questions and answers with Neil, uh, let's uh, just reflect a little bit on his last statement about that it is up to us to make the change and that a change is needed 
and that it's coming from the use of native plants in our landscape and a totally different paradigm shift from the way that we've been gardening before for many of us. So Neil, uh, if you're ready, I've got a couple of questions for you. I know uh, you took us all the way through what is gonna survive the Anthropocene, what's gonna survive after us, geological time, genetic diversity. And I know many people, they're still scratching their heads thinking about things like Apomexis uh, right now. So uh, the first question that we have for you is looking at taking prior agricultural land in a restored part and trying to make it into resembling something that was you know, a native prairie or something that it might've been prior in geological time, perhaps after that one mile of ice. So when you're looking at taking a former agricultural remnant and looking at creating it into a prairie, what type of steps do you take uh, in your process and uh, what type of plants would you recommend? Well, um, actually, uh, agriculture fields, depending upon the history of the fields, can actually be very uh, easy to convert, depending upon the actual use and what is growing or also often more appropriately not growing on that field. So if you look at ag land, you have a variety of different situations. You have actively um, cropped land, and most crop land, if it's, if it's in cash crops like corn or soybeans, 90 plus percent are grown using Roundup Ready genetically modified organisms. So Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soybeans, which is anathema to most, but it put, puts you in the driver's seat as far as weed control prior to seeding a prairie. So actually, that is strangely an optimal situation. A little more challenging is a hay field or an alfalfa field where you have established grasses, alfalfa, et cetera, where you would have to remove that vegetation because if you do not eliminate the existing perennial vegetation on the site, you have a very low success rate because you're competing with established plants by putting in seeds. And that's, a, that's a not a winning formulation. So you have to eliminate whatever perennial vegetation is presently growing on the site. Even more challenging are old fields, abandoned fields that have been grown up to weeds for five, 10, 20 plus years. Those can take two to three years to convert because not only do you have the existing perennial vegetation, but you will have a significant weed seed bank lurking in that soil. So that is a worst case scenario. Not that, it can, that you cannot successfully convert it, but it will take you much longer to work the weeds and the weed seeds out of that situation. You'll never get rid of all the weed seeds because weed seeds can live for decades, but you have to get control, at least some level of control of the perennials. So now it, we can spend a whole hour or and a half on this, but whatever methodology you use, you have to eliminate the existing perennial species before you put down your seeds. And there are people who have, who have actually used methodology where they seed over into existing perennial grasses, et cetera, but it's a painstaking process. It takes 20 to 30 years in most cases and has all too often limited results. So if you want reasonable results that don't cost you a fortune or take forever, get rid of the weeds. How are you gonna do this? You can use herbicides, you can use smother crops, you can use continued tillage, but if you're on a sloping area, you cannot use continued tillage because you have open ground and it will erode. And not only will you lose your soil, but you also pollute the uh, surface waters. Uh, you, if it's a small area, you can smother it, but what are you gonna smother it with? You're gonna smother it with cardboard, old carpets. Uh, are you gonna roll out black plastic? I have a client that will put three acres of black plastic out because they didn't want to use herbicides. So what do you do with all that old black plastic? Where did black plastic come from? It's an oil, oil product, it came from oil. Can you recycle it? Almost nobody will, will take black plastic, dirty black plastic to recycle it. Now you have a huge landfill issue. So what's worth? You have to do an environmental impact statement of what you're actually, what the impact is using the methodology. So you look at uh, chemicals, soil erosion, uh, disposal of waste, et cetera. Um, I used to be strictly organic, but in all honesty, I will use glyphosate to prepare a site. I view it as a um, lesser evil to achieve a greater good. Many people will not, and there are perfectly good methodologies you can use, like some other crops of a, a buckwheat winter wheat or buckwheat winter rye rotation for two years, and you can eliminate the vast majority of not all of the vegetation by using that method, and it will also build your soil. So I don't want to go into too much detail here because we could spend a lot of time on this, but the most important thing is you have to get rid of the existing vegetation before you put down your seeds, and then you have to determine what community you want to create. And so there are many options there. Do you want 
um, a heavy grass to floor ratio? Do you want a heavy floor to grass ratio, which will give you more pollinator services? Do you want to intersperse trees in your in your prairie? A lot of people plant bur oaks or shagbark hickories or a white oak in their prairie. But when you do that, now you're creating a perching spot for birds and the birds will perch there and they'll poop out the buckthorns and the honeysuckles. And now you have an invasive vector that you would not have had if you did not have a tree there. A wide open prairies rarely have problems with invasion in the center, from the edges, you will, from invasive woody plants, but not in the center of it. You put trees out there, and now you've created a whole new uh, problem. So there's tons of tons of different aspects we could talk about here, but uh, um, I don't know if, it, if it's appropriate to, to, to keep going. Um, you tell me. Sounds like a webinar for another day, right? It would easily be an hour and a half, <laughs> guaranteed. I do an hour and a half presentation on this very topic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one, of our, one of our questions came across as, uh, someone that has seen interesting hybrids such as bottle gentian and cream gentian and also compass plant and prairie dock. And I know you focused a lot on the genetics within a species. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the crosses that are possible and why we might not see them uh, as readily available and what role they play in the story of native seed genetics? That's a really great question. And you'll see that a lot of the native ours are crosses of different species, native species, especially the echinaceas. And some are more uh, open to being crossed with other species. So they're used as the base species for crossing with other species. What I've noticed over the 40 years I've done this is I've seen a lot of um, hybrids between the gentians. Lobelias, you'll commonly see a cross between uh, great blue lobelia and, well, not commonly, but occasionally, great blue lobelia and cardinal flower. And you'll get this kind of a nice lavender flower. You know, and they're very difficult to tell these plants apart just by the foliage. But the flowers are what you can tell the difference between the two. And sometimes you'll get these um, obviously genetic crosses, hybrids that are, are lavender in color, purple lavender. Uh, Liatris are really uh, able to cross. And we have to we have had to keep all the different plots far away because Liatris ligula stylus, metal blazing star, is particularly prone to hybridization. And one of the interesting things is why don't you see more of these? I suppose also um, echinacea, of course, people know that, and the silphiums, uh, we see occasional crosses between um, rosin weed and compass plant, compass plant and prairie dock, you will see those. But why don't we see those more in nature? Because typically things like compass plant and prairie dock, in nature, they don't grow in the same soils. Prairie dock is more in a wet mesic prairie in the prairie, in the, the compass plant is more in mesic upland, dry mesic prairie, so they may not be within the proximity where crosses would be as possible. That's not to say that bees are not traveling one to two miles or other pollinators traveling long distances, but again, the farther apart they are, the less likely they're going to be pollinated with the other species. So uh, I think the proximity is limited in nature, but when you bring them into the garden, now there's species that would not normally be that close to each other, next to each other, thus increasing the possibility for, for natural process. Do you see those offspring playing a role in the you know, bigger discussion about ecology in your backyard? The hybrid, the natural hybrid offspring? Yes. Um, that, I guess that depends on what kind of plants you like. I, I don't I don't know um, if people, you know, people are curious. They want to see the new, the different. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. People ask me, hey, Neil, do you have any new plants? And I tell them, no, most of it's from the mid Pleistocene, mid to late Pleistocene. I don't <laughs> have anything new. <laughs> I'm not, you know, we're not making new plants here. I mean, I did 30 years ago. I was like fascinated by it, but you know, I, I went through that stage and came back to my roots. But I think this all brings up the whole native art thing. So you have naturally occurring crosses, you have naturally occurring variants without crossing, just the genetic plasticity. I used to have a fabulous garden of prairie drop seed, all different forms and seed heads. I mean, it was amazing, the variation, just from seed grown plants that were in the seed production fields. So there's tremendous opportunity out there if you want to go out and select plants for different forms, colors, et cetera, just within the native gene pool that you're growing from open pollinated seeds. So yeah, people are always gonna want to something new and different. That's, that's not gonna go away. Well, not to piggyback on the, do you have anything that's new, but <laughs> uh, do you envision continuing to expand what you grow and offer? Uh, and how do you um, determine what species are worth trying? Is it based on the ecological services? Is it market driven? Can you tell us a little bit about the decisions that you make as a uh, nursery professional? Sure. Um, well, 
when I started doing this 40 years ago and literally could not give this stuff away for free, nobody wanted it because they were all weeds. It's been an interesting evolution to see the acceptance of plants that were completely shunned. But once, and, and I tell people we have three products, plants, seeds, and education, information. And without the information, we would never have survived. So throughout our entire history, the, the whole process of selling plants and seeds starts with education. Because frankly, this was a whole new concept for the majority of the population 40 years ago. It was, it was crazy. And they called this the weed farm for 20 years. So because people just didn't get it. And so you're trying to, to sell people on the really the landscape of the future because it has environmental, ecological, and economic benefits and ergonomic benefits, reduced energy. It all made too much sense, but nobody got it. Well, now people get it. It's so great. It's so fantastic. And we're seeing all these new nurseries and regional nurseries. It's just fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. But uh, the way methodology that we use is honestly, uh, it's very market driven. But sometimes we'll, we'll, when there's a species, I say, man, I know we, I know this is a great species. There's, there, you do a Google search and nobody's looking for it. But I know if people knew about this plant, they would like it and they would use it. So it's a combination of market driven. What are people looking for? What, what's trending? What do we think is going to trend? And we're just, what do we think is going to be a great plant that, that's not out there or is underutilized? And so we've done that many, many times. Um, sometimes it works and a couple of times it bombs. It doesn't always work. So, um, and we also, I'll be honest with you, what I learned from growing rare plants early on is they're very problematic for a nursery because most rare plants require very specific growing conditions and most people don't have that. And you're, you're selling people plants that require specific conditions that all too often they won't have and the plant dies and, and you stand behind it. It becomes a diseconomic pursuit. So if you just want to give away plants, you will give the plants away and hope that they live because there were numerous problems. So we tend to look at plants that have as broad an adaptation as possible, or there are many plants that we sell that are narrowly adapted to certain types of uh, soils, uh, growing conditions. We make sure to educate the customer so they know, don't plant it here, make sure you plant it there. And if you don't have the right conditions, please don't buy it in the first place. Can you tell us just a little bit, and I know this could be a whole nother webinar topic as well, <laughs> Can you compare the difference between preservation versus conservation and where you see the role of uh, Wild Ones members being in that discussion? Is that on the preservation side, the conservation side, some of both? And how do you differentiate between the two? Well, I think, first of all, you have to define what is preservation, what is conservation. And there are many people would interpret those as being different things. Other, other people would interpret them as being the same thing. So if you look historically at conservation, conservation was let's save the bison before it's extinct. Let's save the sandhill crane while there's only a few left. So conservation historically going back 150 years was conserving land, conserving species without concern. Well, some concern for genetics because of course when you had an inbred population of, of for instance, bison, how many were left? 40 something bison were left before you know, efforts were made to preserve it, or 120, I don't know, it was not a lot, okay? Fortunately, there was enough genetic plasticity there to create functional herds into the future. So conservation has this history of also being associated with hunting. And so if you really look at it, the motivation for a lot of conservation, including ducks unlimited, whitetails unlimited, trout unlimited, it's so we can hunt more of them, okay? So it depends on your definition of what is conservation. Preservation tends to be less self-interested, at least historically, by definition. Preservation is not so much that I want to make sure we conserve these species so we can hunt and fish them, but let's preserve it for the good of the earth, the good of the planet, and the good of all species. So again, it all comes back to what your definition of these terms is, but if you look at them historically, they do come from very different backgrounds and different motivations. Oftentimes we find ourselves in situations where we have newly exposed soil uh, or maybe a uh, landscape where you've just recently tried to clear out invasive species and you're left with a relatively exposed area. And we know that many invasive species are some of the early ones to adapt to those conditions. Can you tell us a couple species that in your work have been early ones to adapt to outpace or outcompete some of the other native non-native plants? <laughs> 
Oh man. Well, this is so dependent upon your edaphic conditions. What 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 kind of soil, sunlight, etc. Mm -hmm. um, let's just start with the basics. Prairie and meadow restorations are way easier than woodland restorations. Why is that? As we talked about earlier, in a prairie, I don't have trees. I don't have an invasion element waiting for birds to come and bring in all these invasive plants. Yes, in the prairie, I have to deal with windborne seeds. Those are the primary problems that we have. Canada thistle, Canada goldenrod, plants that are in a well-established prairie can still invade, can still invade. In a woodland, you can clear out all the buckthorn, clear out all the honeysuckle. Those species generally have uh, the seeds of those, of those woody species. Generally, after a couple of years, most of the seeds in the soil are non-viable. They're done, and you can go in and, and plant your good stuff. Garlic mustard? Oh, boy. Okay, I've been fighting garlic mustard for 30 years. Okay, I have areas where I have some good vegetation. I go on hand pull it because they don't want to use anything that would, would jeopardize the existing vegetation. I have areas that were solid garlic mustard with a few native wildflowers in it. I've just thrown wildflower and, and sedge seeds in there over years. I pull out the garlic mustard. I've got what was once a solid stand over the last 15 years is down now to small patches, but I've never gotten rid of it. I have other areas where it was pure garlic mustard. It was, I cut down the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and it exploded into garlic mustard because I released the garlic mustard from the dormant seeds by allowing light to get there after removing the overstory of the horrible nasty woody plants. Okay, this is like out of the frying pan into the fire, let's burn up here. Now, what do I do? Well, there was no valuable vegetation. And I will tell you, I went out, <laughs> you're gonna think I'm crazy. I would go once a year, and I, I figured it out. I go out there in June, just before the garlic mustard seeds are ripe, I apply glyphosate once a year. It kills the garlic mustard plants before the seeds ripen and it kills the seedlings, but there's still seedlings that will germinate between that spray and the next year. I did this seven years in a row, seven years in a row. So I got the garlic mustard down to a low roar, and then I went out and, and seeded my wildflower sedges and grasses. I still had garlic mustard. 15 years later, I'm still out there pulling the garlic mustard, but it's, it's only a few plants. So I can go out and cover a few thousand square feet in a couple of hours a year, and I've got this beautiful woodland that I generated from seeds, okay? But my God, is that, I mean, who's gonna do that? Who's gonna go out there and spray the garlic mustard for seven years in a row? It's insane, it's extremely challenging, okay? The other option is to use an organic method, which I've been very successful with, and that is when the garlic mustard is in fruit, okay, just after it blooms, but not mature, you go out with, I go out with a hand side because I don't like using a weed whacker. You can go out with a weed whacker or a hand side and cut the tops, a very sharp weed whacker because you do not want to pull the plants out by the roots. You want to sever the tops, leaving the, the leaves, the lower leaves and the roots in place. You sever the tops, they're just starting to form seed, they'll never mature. The plants, you come back two weeks later, three weeks later, and the, and the plants like melt away into nothing. So you kill the plants, the seeds never mature. You can, I can cover an acre in a Sunday afternoon with my, with my hand side, okay? No chemicals whatsoever. If you have desirable plants, you're gonna chop the heads off of those, but you're using no chemicals. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. And I use pulling in areas where I have good plants. I use herbicides where there's nothing. And then other areas where I can get in there, I use the hand side, you can use a weed whacker. And it's amazing. You will get almost the same results with the hand side method as you do with the herbicide. The reduction in, in garlic mustard is essentially identical over a seven to eight year period. So there's all sorts of ways to do this. So what's the solution? Okay, cut down all the trees and plant a prairie so you don't have to worry about all these bad guys. Easy breezy, <laughs> I'm being absurd, okay? But a prairie restoration is so much simpler because you don't have to worry about this constant invasion. And even after you get rid of all the bad guys, there's still birds up there bringing in the seeds. It's a never ending war. It's not gonna go away. We are in the Anthropocene. We are in trouble, okay? What do you do? Okay. so. You have to choose what is realistic for you. And that's the problem in a woodland situation. It is so difficult because there's so many vectors to bring in the invasive. But I can tell you this, I use in my woodlands, I have found plants that are highly, uh, I would say resistant to invasion. And that include wild ginger, excuse me, wild ginger, a serum canadense. If you have an alkaline soil, pH seven to eight, it will creep and crawl by rhizomes, and it will generally exclude most invasive plants, including garlic, mustard, buckthorn, and honeysuckle, with a few notable exceptions. They'll get in between the nooks and crannies. Over once, once the sod, it's not a sod, but once the, the uh, total surface area is covered by the rhizomes, 
Another plant, Northern Sea Oaks, Chasmanthium latifolium. I'm sure those of you who have grown this know this is, this is an aggressive plant. My God, it will keep out the bad guys. And I, because Chasmanthium is a warm season woodland grass and it doesn't really get going until June, I can include it with a lot of spring ephemerals and it doesn't negatively affect them. It's competing against them because of its root system. But from the activity period time, it's not active in the spring. So I'm able to include a lot of spring ephemerals in with the chasmanthium. Then the chasmanthium takes over in July and just excludes all the bad guys. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing how little junk gets into that chasmanthium side. So there are some strategies. But the problem now is if you're using a few species, you're creating monocultures or near monocultures. So what is the ecological value that you've done? And especially if you're using grasses, which provide little or no pollinator services, what have you accomplished? You've, you, you've replaced an invasive non-native with an invasive native. Did you actually do anything for the ecology of your, of your landscape? Maybe not. So there's all these, all these conundrums and questions and difficulties uh, of what we're doing. So um, you have to really be committed and you really have to have a plan and you have to take your time and get rid of the bad guys before you put in the good guys and then make sure you have a way to keep them up. And hopefully you have some friends from your local wildlands chapter that can help uh, you bring that <laughs> diversity up, right? Yes. You know, another thing is fire. Fire is a very useful tool. It's not a be-all, end-all, solve all your problems because there are many species that are not negatively affected by fire. But you can use fire in, in prairies and savannas very effectively. It won't get rid of Canada thistle. It won't get, can get rid of Canada golden rod. And what I have found is that if you burn your prairie every two years, and this has issues for Lepidoptera and other pollinators, but if my goal is to keep woody plants out, I have found it on two-year rotational burning where I burn half of the prairie one year and the other half the next year, I am able to exclude essentially all woody plants from invading with very few exceptions. If I go to a three-year cycle, the woody plants that have germinated in one year, they will have three years of growth, and that root now is able to survive a fire and re-sprout after that three-year fire. So now you have this terrible trade-off of, well, if I wait three years, uh, I do less damage to certain invertebrates, but now I have more maintenance because woody plants have become established. So if I burn every other year, I can keep my maintenance way down. I don't have to go out there and hand remove, cut and treat the stumps on these woody plants or weed wrench them out or whatever. But now what are the implications for the invertebrates? So you have all these trade-offs, all these questions of, of how you're gonna manage your landscape. All these questions and some, some very poignant answers and even more questions from tonight's lecture. Thank you very much, Neil. And thank you everyone for joining us. We had a terrific evening with you and we hope to see you at another Wild Ones event in the future.